Okay, it's working? Oh, yeah. Okay, Excellent. so whenever you're ready, just tell me to go. Um, okay, uh, uh, maybe Erin should introduce you. And, maybe uh, course, remember to turn on the recording pleasure. if you want to record. Uh, uh, Jan, we are recording and also uh, uh, broadcasting this uh, talk on YouTube uh, uh, and colleagues. I do hope that uh, these are all acceptable terms. Yes, that's fine. Uh, Thanks for being with us. This is. Uh, I don't think uh, the recording is on yet. I don't see. A red no, no, light. It, it's it's being recorded on YouTube. Ah, so, oh, I see. Okay. Sorry. Let me see. Robert has experience of teaching his classes online. Now <laughs> you always have to remember to turn turn on the recording before you start. What I have, though, Jan, uh, is that uh, your uh, talk is being uh, transcripted uh, on my screen. Uh, if this is part of your preferences, that's fine. But uh, I just wanted you to be aware of it. It shouldn't disturb you. But uh, um, OK, how that's happening, I have no idea. Maybe <laughs> I, I did that. And I uh, shared it on mute terms and I will. No, it's not uh, because of my side, apparently, because I allowed you to uh, share your screen, but other things uh, be are beyond my control, apparently. Okay, I have no idea where that came from, because I say I had to relaunch this Zoom thing from the beginning. Well, well that would be helpful for uh, not in uh, Non-native speakers yeah, sure. like I mean, me, so it, it's good, yeah. It, 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 it's yeah, it's not okay, that's people. fine. It does. It doesn't bother me. I've never seen this before, so. All right. Well, uh, as long as uh, uh, you are aware of it and uh, it doesn't uh, hinder your uh, uh, line of thoughts, uh, that's no, that's, that's okay. Well, uh, colleagues, uh, welcome, welcome once again uh, to uh, another exciting talk by Jan Kregel, uh, uh, who is Professor of Finance and Development at Tallinn Technological University, joining us uh, from uh, uh, across the Atlantic, from New York, I presume, uh, uh, right? Uh, yep. This is uh, uh, the Kaderhaus Lectures on Global Political Economy. And uh, Jan uh, uh, will uh, give uh, his thoughts on the modern monetary theory uh, behind and aftermath uh, of it. Uh, and uh, uh, many thanks, Jan, uh, for being with us. Many thanks to colleagues for joining us uh, tonight. Jan, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh. OK, thank you, Eric. There are two things that I want to share with you today, and I hope I will be able to finish both of them before the time runs out. The first is to try and draw a distinction between the early objectives of what eventually morphed into modern monetary theory and has become, I think, a very well, rather disappointing uh, contribution to the way we look at policy. And that will be the first point that I'll deal with. And the second point is that because of the constraints on the way modern monetary theory has been presented, it opens the way to a reconsideration of the proposals that were originally made in the 1940s by Keynes and a number of other people, and I underline this, uh, in terms of proposing a clearing union as the optimal organization for international, uh, international payments and the international financial system. One of the big advantages of this sort of system is that it allows for a coordinated global sharing of international indebtedness rather than bilateral indebtedness. And this, I'm going to argue, is a very big advantage in terms of the kind of issues that we're facing today in terms of providing finance, in particular for the uh, developing countries in facing the problems of loss and damage from climate change and remediation in terms of trying to adjust 
the energy balance in terms of uh, in terms of financing output. So those are the two things that we want to uh, that we want to take care of today. So if we go back and I ask the question, am I MMT? How did it start? Well, I have the advantage of having been there more or less at the, at the birth of what became MMT. And in simple terms, this was a training strategy for hedge funds. Now, it was always very interesting that this was looked at as a branch of Keynesian theory that was launched by someone who was an active trader in international sovereign debt markets. And the question was, or the question that kept being asked is that, how do these two things go together? Okay, why is, why is this uh, theory interested in Keynesian monetary theory when really he's a professional financial market uh, trader? Well, it's a very, simp a very simple answer, is that in that period, there was a very common sovereign bond trade that existed that Warren Mosler used at 3i, John Merriweather used at Solomon Brothers, and was used by a number of, uh, of particular hedge funds. And this was the idea that you could engage in substantial arbitrage profits by using what eventually came to be called the carry trade, which then was just interest rate arbitrage. And in particular, it was borrowing in uh, Deutschmarks at very cheap interest rates, investing in Italian lira uh, bonds and holding those bonds to maturity. This is what we used to call a relative value trade. Now, if you look at that sort of trade, the only risk that you have is a risk of government default. And as Warren tells the story, he visited a number of people in the Italian treasury to try and uh, determine whether or not that default was a reasonable probability. And his result was that no, governments were not likely to default on their uh, sovereign bond issues. And the reason for that was that as long as they could print the currency in which that uh, bond was denominated, they could always pay the interest on the debt. So that it really was a losing proposition to default on the debt. They were always better off in trying to, uh, to inflate their way or to create money in order to pay it off. So this is the beginning of the, of the idea behind uh, behind MMT. And as I say, it was a relatively general uh, trade that was used in, uh, in markets at that time. If you're interested in looking, if you trace it down on the, uh, on the net, you can find descriptions of this trade that, uh, that exist. Now, the next step was the step from being a hedge trader to being a quasi-academic uh, market economist. And Warren started to fund what was a uh, center at the University of Mer Missouri in Kansas City, which was called CFEPS. Okay? It wasn't called MMT. It was called CFEPS. What was CFEPS? It was a center for full employment and price stability. Okay, there was really no idea of MMT at that point, but the idea was that this provided the possibility for joining these two, what seemed to be at that time in the accepted, accepted academic literature, as a trade off. That is, you could either have more unemployment and less inflation, or vice versa. And the argument behind the center was, no, that you could have both of these at the same time. And this is the thing which I think attracted people to this approach in the beginning. And if you look at the way that uh, evolved, it was evolved in terms of providing what eventually became the employer of last resort program. Now, this is where Minsky enters the story because he had proposed a similar type of program totally independently of anything that was, uh, that was generated out of, uh, out of CFEPS. But if you eventually look at the literature, you can find proposals for employment of last resort programs going back to the post-World War I discussions of economic policy. Okay? So it really was not a, a new concept. 
But when it was proposed with CFEPs, nobody really had any uh, historical knowledge or recognition that there was a background to this idea. And it seemed like a very sensible idea. So the idea behind the employer of last resort, and again, these were hedge fund dealers who were doing this. So the obvious way to think about this was an employer of last resort is the government holding a buffer stock of jobs. And buffer stocks were things that had been widely discussed in the uh, run up to the Bretton Woods uh, agreements. So it seemed very sensible that the government could use this employee of last resort program by setting the bid ask prices on the jobs that it used in order to generate uh, the buffer stock to provide stability to wages relative to productivity. So it became a very desirable alternative relative to incomes policy, which had been the uh, preferred post-Keynesian policy prior to that time, and raised only one particular problem. And that was how you were going to finance that stock. If you're a, uh, a dealer in a financial market, you're setting bid ask prices. If people tell you that, yes, they're going to buy from you a certain amount, at the price that you're quoting, you have to have something to sell them. So the problem is that you have to have capital so that you can hold a supply in order to make good on your, uh, on your bid ask prices. So the question arose, how was the government going to finance this stock of, of ELR jobs? And of course there, it joined up with the argument about the uh, hedge fund trade, which said that, well, okay, if the government cannot ever default or will choose never to default on its outside, outstanding sovereign debt, it can simply issue debt in order to finance that stock of, uh, of ELR labor. So that the idea of the no, what I call the no default principle on sovereign debt came in to finance that stock of ELR, ELR jobs. Now, there were a number of estimates that were made at that time. Scott Fulweiler, uh, using the FAIR model, produced a number of estimates that probably this would come up, at least for the United States and developed countries, as something like 1% or 2% of GDP, which was not a big deal. That is, it was not a, uh, a question of having complete autonomy in terms of the ability to generate deficits or anything else. That is, this was a relatively small proportion of uh, government lending and something that we could live with quite, uh, quite easily without any additional sort of theoretical support. But what eventually happened was that what I'm going to call the MMT tail that is the fiscal policy part came to wag the ELR dog. That is the focus very quickly went to the idea that you could spend as much as you wanted in order to finance that ELR, that ELR deficit. Now from there, it became a quick step to extending that no default principle to a, refly, a reply to the deficit hawks. That is the people who were arguing against governments running deficits. Okay. Now, what I'm trying to, to point out here is that these are two different problems. Okay. One is that you're fighting against this trade-off, the so-called Phillips curve, and the other is you're fighting against this idea that deficits are a bad thing for the economy and you should always be having a balanced budget. And what happened was that you ended up with a focus on the latter. Now, as a result of the focus on the latter, you ended up with arguments such as the policy. There's no need to fund the deficit by issuing government bonds. There's no need to tax in order to finance expenditure. All you need is a tax liability to drive the demand for government debt. Now, this is a relatively different kind of argument that you're working on. And you end up with the ideas that there's no need to balance the budget. And very quickly, learners' functional finance came into the story. That is, you use the budget in order to maximize employment, or at least to have an objective of full employment. Then NAP state money came into the story. And I, well, we'll leave that to one side, how that got into it. And even Lerner with the idea of state money. I mean, I can still remember in Washington, D.C., walking down the street with Heidminski and Abba Lerner. Abba was in his sort of pajamas and his sandals. <laughs> 
and talking about this problem. And Lerner was quite saying, well, if there wasn't any government deficit, there wouldn't be any money. And everybody sort of looked at him as if you were crazy. This was the height of, of monetarism. And of course, he was absolutely correct. Everybody had forgotten that he had written a very crucial paper uh, making that point much, much earlier. Okay. So in the end, what you ended up with is the idea of MMT as the idea that as long as you have a sovereign debt, the government has sovereign budget autonomy. And as I look as an under, underlying side, it says this looks like a lot like the neoclassical synthesis of Keynesian fine tuning, because your policy was that you spend as much as you want in order to get the full employment. And the money that you use, well, you target the interest rate by deciding how much debt you're going to be issuing. So basically what you've got is fiscal policy and monetary policy as your two policy, uh, your two policy issues. Now, what I'm arguing is that this lost sight of ELR is an answer to Friedman's reconsideration of the quantity theory as represented by the expectations augmented Phillips curve as an answer to stagflation. And that's the thing that we thought at the time we were, uh, we were fighting. Okay, here is a little uh, scribble from Minsky. Keynesian theory is not just a theory that validates demand management of fiscal policy. He's always insisted that you were looking at what he called liquidity preference as a theory of asset prices. And I've tried to make a big deal out of the fact that it's not only asset prices. You can use liquidity preference as an entire theory of prices to counter the idea that there is no micro foundation to, uh, to Keynesian theory. Anyway, if we go back to this idea of the Phillips curve that we were fighting, those of you who are, well, as old as I am, and I think Robert probably can remember this, he's somewhat younger than I am, but still remembers the arguments that were had at this time, is that if you patch the Phillips curve onto the ISM model, you could plug that hole of the absent micro theory, and that became your entire explanation of prices and price inflation. Now, all of this was generated by what? Well, a number of papers that Friedman had written from the time he uh, started as an active economist dealing with long-term and short-term policy issues. The first issue is a 1948 paper where he sets out his monetary framework uh, for long-term government policy. That long-term framework as he said, this is a quote, monetary framework for a competitive order, since the competitive order cannot provide one for itself. It should operate under the rule of law rather than discretionary authority of administrators. Okay, today we would call that the deep state. That is, Friedman was, well, would have fit in quite nicely in the, uh, the Dow idea of cryptocurrency. Okay. This, MM, this monetary framework would eliminate both the private creation or destruction of money and discretionary control of the quantity of money by central bank authority to, completely, to complete the elimination of the major weapons of discretionary authority, the existing powers to engage in open market operations, and the existing direct controls over stock market and consumer credit should be abolished. Okay? The government would set a full employment expenditure budget and then have an actual budget which would set the stable progressive tax and expenditure policies to balance the former when deficits in the latter would generate automatic stabilizer expenditures financed by direct monetary creation. Okay? Basically, what he did in this 48 paper was to eliminate discretionary government anti-cyclical demand management policy. Okay? And that was the beginning of this reconsideration of the quantity theory. Now, eventually, this idea was extended to what came to be called the expectations augmented Phillips curve. Okay? And this is the case where all sorts of people ended up winning Nobel Prizes for this idea of adding expectations to the idea of the Phillips curve. That idea was what? Well, basically, the argument was that if you look at the short-term use of monetary or fiscal policy. The argument was that any possible benefit 
would come from what came to be called a mismatch of price expectations. That is, this is very similar to the arguments that we find in Hume, when Hume talks about the impact of the expansion of, a, uh, of the domestic money supply as a result of a surplus on external account. That is, what happens is that demand goes up, and in Hume's account, he talks about the farmers running faster behind their plows. Well, in the expectations augmented idea, the idea is that when demand increases, the expectations adjustment is differential between workers and producers. And the argument is that the demand impact on the employers is for an expectation of a demand in sales and an increase in prices, while the workers are using existing price expectations in order to increase their effort in terms of increasing the amount of employment. And the idea is that this will provide for an increase in employment until the workers get savvy, notice that they're actually paying higher prices, and go back to their pre-existing level, uh, pre level of effort. The short term is what? The idea is that the counterintuitive result is that all monetary policy can do is to avoid causing instability by avoiding active monetary policy and unifying real and monetary representation of economic variables. That is to have stable prices. And you have stable prices by having a stable uh, quantity of money or a stable rate of increase in the quantity of money. So these two these two factors not only said that you were looking at this trade-off, but that in fact, in order to get that trade-off, you had to eliminate any active policy, long-term or short-term. And this was the, the idea that this alternative employer of last resort policy was going to provide. Now, as an aside to this, if we look at Friedman's analysis, there's an error in that analysis, okay? If after you increase the money supply, workers are working more and the unemployed are accepting to work, that is, you have an expansion in employment, then by definition, they must have been involuntarily unemployed when they started out, okay? So that you started out not from a position of uh, the natural rate of unemployment, but you started out from a position of involuntary unemployment. That is, there is an internal contradiction in this argument. Okay. Now, most people have forgotten that, and most people really didn't recognize it when it took place. But this was one of the things which this CFEPS analysis was supposed to bring out. That is, that the alternative did not provide any sort of reasonable full employment policy. So the question then became, were you going to use that employment policy side of the argument or the MMT side of the argument, that is the unlimited nature of sovereign government, uh, government expenditures, as the focal point of the theory? And what happened was that very quickly, the political discourse was turned into a discourse in terms of arguing against the so-called deficit hawks. So that we lost, completely lost sight of Friedman and his long-term and short-term monetary framework, and also this idea of the reconsideration of the, uh, of the quantity theory. That is, what should have been the focus of the criticism became simply, well, it boiled down into a political argument. So that if we look at today, the way we look at MMT, we look at MMT primarily as an argument which says the government has autonomy over its budget expenditures. That is, that piece of the original hedge fund argument that has come to dominate. Now, I've listed here the four, uh, the four things that people commonly associate with MMT and then bring about the fifth one. And the fifth one is that. Well, according to Randy Ray, there is a fifth important consideration to have a floating exchange rate as it provides more physical leeway for the government. In this view, the capacity of monetary sovereign government to run deficits is limited only by the real resources at their disposal. Now, the problem with this is what? 
is that the presumption is that floating exchange rate eliminates the external constraint. That is, it keeps your external constraint in balance. Okay. Now, as far as I know, there are a number of conditions that are required for this. The Marshall Lerner conditions were set out by Lerner a long time ago to explain how this might occur. And the other is Keynes' argument at the end of the treatise on money in terms of capital controls. There's a third alternative, and that is that you don't trade at all. That is, you have an autarkic economy in which you don't allow any sort of international trade because the likelihood that you're going to have an imbalance on your international trading account is extremely high. And it's extremely high. Why? Because in a multilateral system, your bilateral balances are always going to be in imbalance. And that means that you're always going to have external debt. And that external debt is going to be denominated in a foreign currency. It's not going to be denominated in your domestic currency. In fact, this was so common, we can skip that, that already in 1944, a very common uh, law book stated the following. Insofar as the currency of an issuing state is concerned, it may be said that the concept of monetary sovereignty exhibits features of both an internal and external character. Internal sovereignty includes the rights to define the monetary system, to devalue the currency, and to operate a monetary policy. External sovereignty includes the right to impose a system of exchange control. In broad terms, the exercise of an internal monetary power cannot be questioned and must be respected by other states. For example, as has been shown, the obligation to recognize the monetary sovereignty of other states lies at the heart of the lex monetai principle. That is, this is part of, already part of international law, long before our hedge fund traders got to work with this and long before MMT. So the point is that and here is the quotation from Lerner. Lerner also very clearly okay, made the same point. He issued a caveat, all this is true only of internally held national debt. That is, MMT holds for debt that is internal and denominated in the domestic currency. Incre increasing debt to other countries or to citizens of other countries does indicate impoverishment of the borrowing country and enrichment of the lending country. Of this kind of debt, the popular criticism is valid. When a country borrows from another country, that is something like when one man borrows from another or when one business borrows from another. That is, there is an international deficit hawk, and that is international trade or what any development theorist would call the external constraint. That is, MMT can't simply eliminate the external constraint by assuming that flexible exchange rates are going to bring about balance. Now, if that is the case, it means that unbalanced trade will always be a constraint on sovereignty and that MMT will work, well, will work under a series of conditions that have never occurred in practice and are unlikely to occur in practice. Now, if that is the case, then we have to look at the possibility that there are alternative types of international financial systems which would allow for a certain amount of independent domestic sovereignty in an interdependent global financial system. Now, the answer to this is what? Well, this is what I'm going to be going to call a global bookkeeper. And this is what Keynes, in fact, was proposing with the clearing union. He talks about an international clearing union in which you have domestic debits and credits of countries where the necessary equality of credits and debits of assets and liabilities can be removed outside the clearing system, but only transferred within it. It can with safety make what advances it wishes to any of its members with the assurance that the proceeds can only be transferred to the clearing account of another member. That is, we can't have a currency crisis and we can't have a debt crisis in this sort of uh, in this sort of system. Now, if you look at an alternative proposal, 
And I've suggested that Keynes' proposal was not the only one. There was an autonomous proposal at the time, which was very similar to the clearing union proposal. And there was also a proposal by Schumacher. Schumacher's proposal was one in which you had a very simple system in which each individual country had a domestic clearing union. If an importer had to make a payment, he made a payment in his domestic currency to his domestic clearing union so that all imports and exports were cleared domestically in the domestic currency by the domestic clearing union. Incidentally, this is in fact how most clearing took place under the gold standard. So this was not a great invention on Shoemaker's part. It was simply a historical problem. Now, the question is, whether there, when there was a deficit or a surplus, what that domestic clearing union would do with that deficit or surplus. And his contribution was to say that if you had a deficit country in which the importers were buying more from abroad than they were selling, that there would accumulate a surplus balance in that clearing account. What would you do with that? Well, he said, what you should do is to buy domestic bonds with it. And those domestic bonds would be used in a global clearinghouse. The global clearinghouse would hold that constellation of deficit country bonds for the account of the creditor countries. Okay. Now, the interesting part of this is that number one, there's no bilateral indebtedness that takes place in such a system. And the creditor countries don't have direct claims on any individual countries, but they have a direct claim on the accumulated bonds that the deficit countries have bought and deposited with the Global Clearing Union. Schumpeter then, or uh, Shoemaker then goes on to argue that this provides an incentive for creditor countries to eliminate those holdings. Why? Well, as he argued that these bonds are the weakest, the most, the highest credit risk of the bonds in the entire global system. So that if you're trying to diminish your credit risk, the easier way to do that is to use those bonds in order to buy exports from the deficit countries. So that you have an incentive in terms of the way risks are distributed and debts are distributed in the system in order to eliminate those deficits as fast as you possibly can. Now, this is a system in which, well, as uh, he says, this is a system in which you have no international currency. Okay, you don't need an international currency for this system to function. You don't need a dollar being the dominant currency. You don't need to substitute the dollar with SDRs or any type of ersatz currency or invented currency. Each country keeps its domestic currency and each country keeps its payments internally. And this is the proposal which, uh, which allows for the possibility, which, uh, well, I would suggest, allows for the possibility of keeping a certain amount of domestic monetary sovereignty within the context of MMT. So if you're going to use MMT and recognize that external constraint, this is one way of moving that external constraint from a bilateral basis to a multilateral basis. In fact, what uh, Shoemaker called this was his system of multilateral clearing. And the distribution of risk is also based on a multilateral basis. And this would provide a much better argument than the one which simply said that any individual country simply had to introduce a flexible exchange rate and then it could eliminate its, uh, its external balance. So if we're, yeah, the last thing that I can do is to say that this type of clearing union is more attractive today than it was in 1944, because in fact, well, we now have blockchain and all of these digital uh, 
digital advantages, and the central banks are considering setting up their own digital currencies. So it would be much, much easier to set up this international clearing system and the global bookkeeper, which could now be done by some sort of, uh, some sort of domestic blockchain, rather than, uh, rather than relying on flexible exchange rates in order to bring about balance. So, having said that, I hope I haven't gone too far over the uh, over the time limit. There are a number of papers which are available on a website if you choose to uh, if you choose to go and look at them, where I spelled out all of these things at uh, at great length. So, Erich, that's the the end of the the story that we have for today with these two specific factors. The one is the constraint on the MMT system that is created by the, uh, the impossibility of eliminating the external constraint and the possibility of trying to use an, a different type of international institution in order to provide some uh, alleviation to that sort of constraint. Many thanks, Jan. Uh, that was uh, really indeed uh, uh, to the point, uh, and uh, many thanks for your con uh, contributions. Uh, that was very uh, thought provocative uh, and uh, clear. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Not only that, it was extremely en enlightening. I'm going to listen to your presentation again and again to understand uh, the details. I mean, this is history. That you know how, how it evolved. I mean, I never. Uh, knew these these days uh, when I looked at uh, only what the current MMTers are saying. Uh, the, the, how it evolved seems amazing. I mean, as I said, I'll listen to you over <laughs> and over again until I understand everything. Thank you. It, it was uh, unbelievable. All right. Colleagues, uh, uh, questions and uh comments and uh, uh, anything uh, that uh... Ah. Mr. Velasquez, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tegel, for the presentation. Uh, pretty much eliminated. Um, I have a question about uh, the role of the uh, liquidity preference here. And, um, you know, like you connected that with uh, higher risks, ideas on liquidity preference and how uh, even, you know, developing countries have this uh, problem that they don't have the, the, I mean, the liquidity preference they have is for uh, right now the dollar. So, and that's why, you know, monetary policy is also, impacted by the Fed. And in that same line, um, I, if I'm not wrong, um, Rise was kind of a skeptic about the uh, programs like uh, the lender of large resort, the lender of large resort, the employer of large resort, because of um, the issues related with the monetary policy. So I don't know if you can um, say something about uh, these issues in, in your presentation. Yeah, well, the thing is that that Hayo was very, very much enamored of what he called the Berlin School of Keynesian Economics. And this was very much impacted by the fact that he lived in a country that was, well, it had an external, an external credit position. Internally, the private sector had an external credit position and the government had a credit position. Now, this is a very anomalous combination, and we used to go back and forth arguing about whether this was reasonable. Now, there is an argument to be made in terms of the, of the counter argument to MMT, which was, used in, uh, which was used in Argentina after the crisis. That is, if you look at the... Uh, uh, the policy that was used there, the government managed to run a surplus. And according to MMT, this is a very bad idea. Well, according to the Argentinians, this was a very good idea. And the Argentinian government always argued that having a credit surplus is a 
power concept more than anything else. That is, if you have a power concept, then you can control your domestic monetary policy. Now, that surplus on fiscal account in Argentina at the time, after the uh, 2001 crisis, was in combination with an external surplus. So that, in fact, what was happening was that you had a position in which the government surplus was being offset by sales to foreigners. And if you think of it that way, that is, if you manage to have an external surplus, which is greater than your, uh, your fiscal surplus, then, in fact, you can have a domestic system which has a very positive uh, private domestic system, which has a very positive demand uh, impact. And this is basically the way the Argentinian uh, recovery took place. So if you look at the period after, say, 2003, you find investment and consumption expanding very, very rapidly uh, as a result of this particular combination. So this is one, uh, one argument. Now, the problem was that this was really not the result, as MMT would have it, of having a flexible exchange rate. That is, the exchange rate at that point had uh, uh, had gotten to the point of four to one, and in fact tended to appreciate rather than depreciating after uh, after the period. So that's the the kind of response I would give. I mean, if you look at Hi Ohio, has this idea that it's conceivable to have an economy in which everybody is in credit. Okay, now that's possible only if the rest of the world happens to be in deficit. And as long as you've got the U.S. that manages to be in very large deficit, that's fine. But as soon as the U.S. goes in a different direction, you get into difficulty. Or if you happen to be a major trader, not with the United States, but with China, which is what Germany ended up, uh, ended up doing, then the situation is not, is not quite so easy. Now, on the problem of ELR, sure, there are all sorts of problems with employer of last resort programs. Uh, but the employer of law, I mean, I, it's always struck me as very strange that people are willing to provide all sorts of criticisms to the operation of ELR programs when they ignore the difficulty with the kinds of alternatives that we have. And the kinds of alternatives that we have are unemployment insurance or the absence of unemployment insurance or some sort of religious or some other support. Uh, to low-income families. So, you know, if you say, well, you know, the employer of last resort is something that can't work because of all of these operational difficulties, if you look at the uh, unemployment insurance, the difficulties there are just as great. And in fact, we've just had the announcement in New York State that I don't know how many billions of dollars have been spent on unemployment benefits for people who were, in fact, not unemployed. That is, the money was simply the equivalent of being dropped out of a helicopter, I guess. I don't know. They were, the, the money was uh, irrigated so rapidly that nobody managed to do any verification to find out if these people were working or not working. So there's a, a balance on both sides. I mean, yes, employer of last resort programs, if you study them, are programs that work on the local level, on local organization. That is, they're not programs that are run from the center by the, uh, by the federal government. And this is why they are, in fact, rather difficult. The successful programs that exist or that existed uh, after the Argentinian crisis in the uh, program that they had, which was very similar to an employer of last resort program, existed because Historically, you had local self-help organizations who stepped in to operate these programs. That is, it wasn't the central government, it wasn't the Department of Labor that organized these programs. These were programs that were run by people who had been running these sort of local, uh, local beneficiary programs since the time of the collapse of Peron. So that it's, you know, this is not a question of, of having set up that program as, a, uh, uh, as an initial basis. Duhalde was the, uh, was the president who introduced this particular program. It's a program that he had run 
already when he was uh, the intendente or the local governor of the province of Buenos Aires. So, you know, he had prior experience or there was prior experience in running these programs. Interestingly enough, if you look at the Roosevelt programs under the New Deal, you discover that almost all of the programs that were introduced under the New Deal had been introduced by Roosevelt when he was governor by this, uh, the state of New York. And these programs had existed in the state of New York before that. So we're really, you know, we're talking about successful programs which build on a past that already existed rather than dropping these things in as a uh, as a new introduction or a new kind of uh, a new kind of policy many thanks Jan. many thanks you uh, uh, anything further uh, uh, to pass on or? no no Yes, so thank you very much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it, and I will have to see it again to, to fully understand all the details. But I have just one question. Randall Ray often mentions Wynne Godley um, and the sectoral balances approach as an important influence to MMT. And as, I far, as far as I understand, for Godley, as for Calder at Cambridge at the time, the external constraint was quite an important matter in what they call the new Cambridge approach. So the question is, if Godley was such an important influence on the sectoral balances approach towards two for MMP, then uh, why is it... Uh, I'm hearing some sort of feedback. Someone must have this... Well, uh, maybe you need to mute uh, yourself. Maybe there is a, a echo coming from there. Uh, if I mute myself, you cannot hear me. <laughs> That's true. It's someone else who must mute. I don't know who. Someone Turn off, try turning off the sound on your computer. Not not your mute, but the computer yeah. sound. Yeah. Yeah. Someone must okay. well, uh, maybe you need to mute uh, yourself. Maybe there is a... Well, what I did is that I reduced the volume for myself because I... I but anyway... The question is, um, why do you think this influence from Godley was not uh, taken into consideration? Because it seems that it, Godley plays an important role in the narrative of how MMT came about. And the new Cambridge approach will be one where the external constraint will be very important. In fact, debates in Cambridge with Richard Kahn and other people were centered around that. So why didn't that come across more fully into the approach? Was this clear now? Yeah, okay, that's a very interesting question uh, to which I really don't have a direct answer. I don't know, you probably should ask Randy that more directly. Uh, having been, what should I say, actively involved in this early period, both at uh, in the time when uh, Wynne was in the United States and Randy and I were both in the same place with him. I mean, I remember having a, a room across from uh, across from Wins at that time. Certainly, there was interaction, but I don't recall any direct discussion with Wynne on this general concept, okay? And at that time, uh, Wynne was running, well, he was developing the uh, international aspect, the global aspect of the model which had been run prior on the purely on a domestic basis. And I remember that when, well, when and I used to go to Washington in order to give what we call dog and pony shows uh, to the congressional staffers on the forecasts that came out, uh, that came out of the model. And you know, you could, you can sort of ask yourself what I was doing there and I could never figure that out. But it's just that if you knew Wynne, Wynne was a very modest and, what should we say, socially restrained person and was unwilling to go by himself. So basically what I used to do is to go and give a 15 or 20 minute introduction to the, to the forecast and then he would, he would do the forecast in Washington. All of this was completely independent of, uh, of any discussions of... Uh, 
of MMT at that time. In fact, in fact, most of this was prior uh, to the developments that went on with uh, with MMT. And if you if you go back to the the well, yeah, we'll just leave that to one side. We'll leave it leave it at that. Uh, and that's as I say, that's only my my personal experience, and that's the best I can I can do for you to answer that question. It is it is you're quite right, rather perplexing that there is this, uh, what shall I say, tendency to ignore the, the existence of the external constraint on these sorts of things, especially when it was, I mean, it was so clear in, uh, in learners, the quotation that I put on the uh, uh, website come from the economics of control. I mean, it's, it's quite, quite simple to read, you know, to simply read through the book to find these things. Uh, and the uh, the passage that I took from this 1944 law uh, law journal or law book uh, also suggests that this was a you know a very common a very common idea that was not invented in order to take care of account. There is a possibility. I mean, according to uh, Joe Mitchell who recently had made a presentation in the meeting that Aaron and I attended in The Hague. He claims that the first place in which the reference to uh, the flexible exchange rate solving this problem came in what, which was in fact the first Minsky summer seminar, which uh, was organized some 12, 12 years ago. I, my memory is, is not you know, very clear on that, some, around 12 years ago, in which when the MMT presentation was made and when the uh, students who were attending these seminars came primarily from developing countries, the first question that was always made to Randy after the presentation was how do you deal with the problem of the external constraint? And apparently that instant response was, well, as long as you've got a flexible exchange rate, you don't have to worry. Now, the reason for that was why? Well, if you think of this in the context of the gold standard, okay, if you have a gold standard, gold is the dominant currency, it becomes the denomination currency for your external debt, and if you get rid of gold, then you get rid of the, the external debt. So flexible exchange rates got rid of gold as a fixed exchange rate. So it, you know, it probably seemed like a reasonable answer uh, to that sort of argument. The only difficulty is that if you had, well, as I did, if you had taught international trade and international monetary theory for a long period, you remember all of this martial learner <laughs> these martial learner conditions, and you remember that they're very, very difficult to meet. So that it's not something that you can sort of hand wave and say, well, you know, we can, we can forget about the external thing as long as we have a, uh, a flexibility in exchange rates. Because historically, flexible exchange rates have not been a means of stabilizing your external account, but usually have generated conditions that have made your external account worse. If you remember the old J curves and all of these other things uh, that we used to teach, and I presume people still teach today. Matthias, so nice to have you on board. Uh, nice to be here. Sorry, I I I came late, and I thank uh, Ivan for for letting me know that this was happening. So I I caught I caught a good chunk of of the talk, but not 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 all and. But I, I, one little comment and, and a question, you know, given what Nuno asked. Uh, so in in my experience, actually, Win went on the other direction. I always say that Win thought that England had an external constraint, and certainly England did have that by the seventies. But Win, I think, to some extent, thought that the U.S. might eventually uh, have one, which I'm less sort of uh, clear that certainly at that time was was a reasonable thing. So I don't know if Jan has a you know, anything to, to, you know, any insight on that, on what he thinks, but, you know, that that's the, but the other thing, the question is, you know, now that we're talking about wind and wind influence and whatnot, like three years ago, 
um, it was a presentation that Stephanie was supposed to give, but um, but she couldn't come, and and Randy presented, and and in the slides, and and we never quite got a, a reply to that. He he suggested, or she was suggesting, he just presented that Abba Learner was less relevant uh, in the development of, uh, or or not relevant for some of the crucial ideas of MMT that those came directly from from Minsky. And in, in my head, I always, and maybe I'm wrong, and it's, but you know, the, the three things that I normally say to MMT were, you know, charter list money, functional finance, and employer of last resort. And I always thought that two of those are I'm a learner. So I don't know, again, and maybe you're not the right person to ask this, but you know, if you have any insight on, on why a learner is seen as less relevant, uh, you know, by, by many MMT authors. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, historically, at the beginning, they made no reference to learner at all. And in fact, I can still remember telling them that, you know, if you want background to them, that, in fact, I ended, you know, say my mea culpa, I ended up contributing NAP to that discussion and contributing learner to that discussion. Because as it started out, as I said before, this was simply the discussion with Warren. Okay, and the way those discussions went, when I went through the, the slides, I had a thing in there about the uh, visiting card theory of money or whatever it was. Okay, and this was a, uh, a very important part in terms of the discourse that went on. Warren would tell the story about his domestic household and how his kids never did any work and his house was a mess and everything else. Okay. At a certain point, he told his kids, okay, now, if you want to live here, you have to provide certain services. Now, for those services, I will pay you, okay, in terms of my visiting cards. And in order to take the benefits of the households, you're going to have to present those visiting cards in order to access them. Do you want to eat? Do you want a bed to sleep in? Do you want a house to live in? you have to come up with visiting cards. And he would tell the story about how his house became very clean and very nice to live in as a result of this visiting card system. So if you take that system and you convert it to the financial system and you say, okay, what the government does is that it issues visiting cards when it buys stuff and it requires visiting cards when it requires you to pay taxes, okay? There's MMT in a nutshell. And that's where the discussion started out, okay? So you don't need Learner for that. You don't need Win Godly for that. You don't need Nap for that. You don't need anything for that. All of these things, in fact, historically came in later. So that, you know, historically, she's formally correct to say that in the beginning, it wasn't there. But in the beginning, it wasn't there because most of this started out and most of this, most of the impetus for this came from Warren. Okay. He was the one who was pushing this. And of course, his background was, you know, he did have a degree in economics, but he didn't present this as, you know, okay, this is functional finance coming in or this is German, uh, German. Uh, state theory of money or anything of that sort. Yes, that did, you know, technically it's correct that that came in later. The problem is that when that stuff came in later, it sort of took over the whole, uh, uh, the whole movement. And I, you know, I can still remember saying, well, you know, at one point saying, you know, okay, NAP is fine, but, you know, look at Schumpeter. Schumpeter thought NAP was an idiot. And that's something which they, you know, nobody, as far as I know, has never ever bothered to uh, to try and confront. So you all have business cards, so you say you can you can do this. Well, I doubt my son would work for the business <laughs> cards. <laughs> Well, turn him over, turn him over to the dinner table. <laughs> Questions? Can, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah. 
Uh, professor, first of all, thank you for this great presentation. Uh, I want to ask that the, what do you think about the the shike criticism or, or in the recent books? You know, the, b briefly, he says that the, uh, the in the fiat money system, you have no limit in the uh, monetary expansion. Uh, you can finance uh, in the government expenditure but there is a limit in the system limit is the profit le pro profit level level of profit is a maximum and sustainable level of growth if you uh, in, and the system needs a pool of employment if you drill the pool you can face the uh, higher wages and uh, the lower profits and you can face the inflation and the unemployment at the same time. This is the basic criticism of Denver Shacks uh, uh, for the uh, MMT. So what do you think about this? And the second question is, what is uh, what are the other possible risks of the implementing MMT? Thank you. Okay, to start with, uh, even before we get to Shaikh's criticism, Minsky was always very skeptical of this idea that it was there was an unlimited amount of government debt that you could issue. Okay, now there are large a number of reasons for this, which he spelled out quite clearly. You don't have it's not necessary to go back and and look at all of them, but if you're a financial market operator, okay, you recognize that there are limits to the amount of debt that, that you can issue. Now, the difficulty is that really nobody backing MMT should ever have made that argument, okay? The technical limit to the argument is one that you go back and you say, okay, if you have the argument that says the government budget should always be balanced, okay? MMT provides you with an argument which says that that particular proposition is false, okay, in terms of a, of a policy proposition. Now, whether we needed MMT to do that or not, I'm not sure. I mean, when Keynes used Kahn's multiplier in order to demonstrate that savings would always equal the amount of investment or whatever it was, you had sol already solved that problem, okay? So you really didn't need MMT to make that particular argument. So those people who say that there is an unlimited, that an unlimited supply of government debt that you can issue really are, have, are overstating, uh, broadly overstating the case. Now, if you look at the way Keynes dealt with this argument, the papers that he, well, these really weren't papers, these were internal policy documents that came out in the Treasury after the Second World War, it's quite clear that what he had in mind was to say that you can always, well, if you look at the a passage in a, uh, I think it was a BBC uh, uh, program that he made where he was talking about the post-war reconstruction finance. And he said very clearly, the problem is not finance. It is finance we can solve. And that's the argument that in a fractional reserve banking system, okay, the supply of finance is infinite, technically infinite. And his argument was, well, the problem is not finance. The problem is that we lack architects and we lack bricks and we lack the things that are necessary in order to reconstruct, okay? So you might want to go in the other direction and say, well, Keynes believed in a, a system of real variables rather than monetary variables. Well, that's not correct either, but that gives you some idea of how he looked at this ability to run a government deficit. You can run a government deficit, and I think this is the correct uh, enunciation of what you get out of MMT, that is, the government has the ability to buy anything that can be produced by issuing its liability. That's correct. That is, there is general, there is always excess capacity, and you can always buy a little bit more if you choose to do so, okay? If you go back to John Robinson and her discussion of disguised unemployment, 
Okay, there's always some margin in terms of increasing productivity in the system and so forth. But that doesn't mean that you have an unlimited possibility of increasing your indebtedness. And it's that point that Sheikh's criticism comes in. That is, it is a criticism of the unlimited issue of government debt, which says that, yes, you have internal consistency problems. And if you're willing to run in a system which has an ever increasing rate of inflation and an ever increasing rate of unemployment, you end up in Sheikh's sort of worst of all possible worlds. And that's, that's perfectly plausible. But the problem is that you started out with the wrong premise rather than, uh, than this is a real criticism. Now, there are, uh, and one of the problems is that if you look at the way MMT is enunciated now, you have a large number of people who, uh, what should I say, are not, mm, how can we put this nicely? That, who, that do not have the appropriate theoretical and historical background in order to recognize the limits on, uh, on that proposition. Okay? And this is one of the reasons why uh, I've been extremely frustrated in the way this discussion has gone on, because a lot of people have simply looked on this as, as now a carte blanche on the ability to spend as much as you want whenever you want to do it, rather than recognizing that these internal constraints do in fact, whether they're internal or external constraints, actually do exist. Your external constraint is, well, if you look at your domestic economy, there is a maximum that you can produce, even if you generate, you know, if you eliminate all of your disguised unemployment, you do run into a limit and then, you know, you run into a, you run into a, uh, a constraint. Or if you start borrowing from a, borrowing resources from abroad, you under end, uh, end up with the limit on your sovereignty, and that's an external limit. So that's, uh, I think, in that, in that dimension. But the, the Shanks proposition, given that premise, is in fact correct. Can uh, Tansel a uh, uh, has a question on chat box uh, if you can uh, have access to it uh, or otherwise I can read it uh, through uh, however you feel. Oh, okay, let me let me see now. Let's see. Oh, okay. That, okay, Robert is gone. That's ugly. Thanks. Okay, Tansel. Maybe the thing about Lerner could be like that. In his first pieces about functional finance, it's not so clear and has some exogenous money dimensions in it. But when we look at his 1947 piece, Money of the Creature of State, is more about Chartist money and looks nothing original in it. We see nearly the same argumentation with Knapp's book. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's... Uh, now, I can't, I can't rem remember because I haven't read the, the state money piece recently, whether he has a direct reference to NAP or not, I'm not sure. What I have subsequently discovered is that NAP was not the only guy there, okay? You have Ben Dixon, who was in the, who was in the story, and eventually there is a English, apparently an English translation of Ben Dixon coming out. You have Albert Hahn, who was also in that area. That is, there was a whole, um, I say a whole panoply of alternative monetary approaches being discussed in Germany uh, at that time. So that whether uh, whether Lerner took this from Knapp directly or simply took this from this wider uh, wider environment, I'm not sure. Okay, so that in in. Those in that in that particular term, I think you're correct in saying that what he had taken was something which was an isomorph of the of what you find in Nap. But the other thing is that I don't know the number of people who have actually read Nap. You can probably count on your uh, one hand because it's a dreadfully boring and complicated book, and for English readers, we don't even have the whole thing. That is, the, the translation is simply a partial translation of the original. Now, as I've already mentioned, if you look at Schumpeter, Schumpeter had no, had no qualms at all 
about uh, about that this was abject nonsense. Now it's difficult to understand why he was so against this unless you read the uh, Schumpeter's treatise on money, which in fact, as an English reader, only appeared about five or six years ago in translation. But it is quite clear that the reason for this is that he exemplifies this idea of the, if you like, the hat check or the token, uh, the token money and this idea of using balance sheets and clearing. Now, in the presentation, I sort of skipped over this. I've spent most of my, most of the last 10 or 15 years trying to work out this alternative, what I now call the imaginary money approach which I think represents a viable alternative, which nobody remembers, which has sort of completely disappeared from monetary discourse as a result of the dominance of Friedman and, uh, and the quantity theory. But Schumpeter was well in line with that particular approach. And if you read the, his, the treatise, which he chose not to publish, basically because he thought Keynes's treatise had stolen everything that he had to contribute. I think this is absolutely untrue, but that was his argument, that you discover the best criticism that you can make of Knapp's, uh, of Knapp's theory, rather than what you find in the history of economic analysis and a number of random, uh, random statements uh, in his published, in his Absolutely, you know, is of the published work during his uh, during his lifetime. Tensel, I can see you. So, <laughs> okay, you want to come back on that or not? No, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your answer. So, any other questions, suggestions, comments uh, since uh, we captured uh, Jan uh, in a corner here uh, and uh, <laughs> let's try to make the most out of uh, his presence. Uh, this is uh, that. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you don't get to. Uh, oh, God. Uh, says. Thanks. Özgür is not able to speak. Uh, that's why he's writing now. He's sick. Um, Oscar is sick. Did Oscar got, got contaminated or what happened? Uh, not I COVID uh, according to the, uh, the medical profession, but... Uh, something like that. Uh, flu or something, if, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I have lots of questions to ask, but uh, I, I guess uh, we said one hour and 20 minutes or so we are coming to to the end. Um, maybe we should ask uh, if there are any other questions from any other of the participants. One thing I promise, however, Jan, is that I'm going to listen to this presentation over and over again until I understand <laughs> them. <laughs> uh, well, uh, it was uh, not only theoretically intense, but also lots of uh, uh, historical information that most people don't know. Uh, one thing that I uh, feel uneasy about is that I don't want to give names, uh, but a large number of uh, mainstream economists are attacking MMT without knowing anything about its historical development, nor uh, understanding what exactly it, 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 it's about. Um, maybe we should invite them to listen to your uh, presentation so that they would have some idea about what they're objecting to. Uh, unfortunately, uh, lots of these criticisms are baseless uh, because they don't know what they are talking about. Don't they? Don't even go and uh, read the basic documents of these uh, MMTers' uh, arguments. But I don't know. Uh, 
that's uh, this is a service that we did to them I, I believe if they listen to you maybe they will have uh, some understanding but uh, most likely they will not uh, listen to this also yeah Who I knows? mean the I, I think you're quite you're quite correct there the problem with this is that once this discussion degenerated into a simply a discussion of deficit hawks versus deficit doves you open yeah. yourself up to this sort of this sort of debate and this is the the thing which frustrated me uh, a great deal about the way mmt developed because this idea of focus always focusing on the deficit and the the ability to spend you simply you know you simply opened yourself up to those sorts of attacks and obviously people who had a ready-made criticism of that approach simply pulled it out and made that as their objection rather than trying to figure out just exactly what was behind this uh, this particular approach now as i mentioned before there is a uh, the unfortunate well this, this is not unfortunate but when you when I did well when I used to teach this as uh, uh, as monetary theory, there is a tradi German tradition which goes back to Hayek and Mises, which is part of this. Okay, and this is the the thing which is sort of interesting is that the people who are attacking MMT have absolutely no idea that they think they are Hayekians or Misians or whatever they are, and <laughs> they haven't got the common sense to go back and try and figure out why these people thought this was a, a sensible idea. I mean, Albert Hahn, Del Albert Hahn is a very good example of this, who started out as a, uh, a quasi-NAP um, supporter, ended up after hyperinflate, Weimar hyperinflation and everything else by completely reversing his position and becoming a monetarist hawk. So, you know, they look at this last part without going back to his early writings and asking, you know, what, what was sensible? Why did he change his mind? And what convinced all of these Austrians and Germans that this was a very sensible approach? So if you, remember, you go back from 1900 onwards, this was a quite normal kind of discussion. That is, you, you, you would not have rejected this out of hand. And now the way it's presented is that, oh, well, you people think that we're going to have deficits and we know we can't have deficits. So now that's the end of the story. So I think you're, you're quite right. That, uh, yeah, uh, I have one other issue with... Uh the practical presentation of MMT and it's that given the current laws and regulations in the US, uh, the US government uh, um, that, in other words, the US Treasury cannot directly borrow from the uh, US Central Bank, that is the Fed, uh, consequently the government can spend as like as uh, as, as it likes. Um, doesn't reflect the reality it cannot happen right I yeah mean, that i mean that's true but these are i mean very interesting institutional ideas yeah. okay because if you look the the idea of having a debt limit that came about because the u.s government had issues of a number of alternative different types of debt oh yeah and the, and the congress at one point decided okay we're going to consolidate all right Britain did the same thing at a certain point, okay? Mm -hmm. So they passed a law and it said, we're going to take all of the debt which exists and we're going to convert it into something which is a more comprehensive set of borrowings, okay? In doing that, they set the limit to the amount of debt that they were going to deal with. And that's where you got the debt limit, okay? Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with whether or not you should have a deficit or not. Obviously, you had had a deficit for a large number of years, aside from the post-Jackson period, and that's where the debt came from. So it wasn't a discussion about whether it was good to have a deficit or a surplus. It was simply a number that they chose to say that this is the amount of debt which is outstanding, which are, we are going to consolidate. Okay? So that's where that came from. 
the idea of running an auction of government debt with the private sector came from where? It came from the fact that when the government started borrowing in the, this was in the period either before or after the First World War, okay, that the only counterpart of the government was Morgan. And the other bankers objected. They said, it's not fair that Morgan becomes the house that does all of the government financing of the government debt. So they created this system which said that, no, you can't do this as we've done it in the past. We have to open it up to the competitors of Morgan. And that's where you got this institutional system which comes up okay now all of this has absolutely nothing to do with the the theoretical concepts behind i don't know charterless money or mmt or any of this other stuff these are simply historical and institutional facts that were accumulated over time which as you say quite rightly create a divergence between the actual operation of the government debt market and the theory behind MMT. So you have this sort of uh, fictitious argument between whether or not you run the, uh, you can consider the treasury and the central bank as a single unit. Interestingly enough, when they were discussing the creation of a centralized reserve unit, that is what eventually became the Federal Reserve, the argument was that it might have been in the treasury. And probably it would have been more sensible to have it in the treasury. And I would argue that if you have central bank digital currencies, that it would be more sensible to have that in the treasury. Because there's no need to have a central bank that issues a digital currency. The treasury can do it very well. Yeah. Treasury issues banknotes. It puts serial numbers on the banknotes. It can also do that with the digital currency. Central bank digital currency could allow you to eliminate the central bank, to eliminate the deposit insurance, because yeah. you don't need deposit insurance if there is no private credit risk associated with your, uh, with your digital currency. So it would be a greatly simplifying uh, operation to do that. And then you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have that problem anymore. Of course, the, the, of course the, the bankers would not be very pleased with this. Oh, yeah. I mean, so what you suggested uh, pretty much uh, eliminates the need for the banks, uh, if I'm not wrong, right? I mean, the... That's right. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, in reality, uh, I have an idea of uh, some sort of... Uh, well, it would take a lot of time if I go into details, but... but uh, a single bank with uh, autonomous uh, local branches. You could work it that way too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a single country, if if, if the autonomous branches uh, respond to the demands of uh, the borrowers who are also uh, their depositors, why do we need a central bank, right? Because that single bank can always. Uh, um, uh, make the payments uh, among its uh, branches as uh, the current banks are doing, right? They, they yeah. don't need the central bank for that. Yeah, but uh, that would be, that's it's just a domestic clearing unit, which is, uh, uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's what we used before we had the Federal Reserve. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> anyway, um, any other questions, maybe? If not, then I thank you. Uh, Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. I was very happy to participate. Many it's nice to see Aaron again uh, back, in the, back in Holland. Where are you, uh, in New York these days? Yep, I'm in New York. Manhattan? No, we're in the country. Oh, okay. I will be in Manhattan um, in about three, four days or so. If you were there, I would like to visit you, I would have said, but apparently you are not that close. That close. Anyway, thank you. Okay. All right, folks. Uh, many